do is uh, talk today about the future of melanoma therapy, uh, but also the impact on all therapy, because what we present here is not just for melanoma patients, it's for every patient. And, and clearly the work that's uh, been done in melanoma has been translatable to many solid tumors. The approvals of PD-1 in melanoma has set the stage for the most recent approvals of uh, the similar drugs in lung cancer, bladder cancer, uh, head and neck cancer, upcoming reviews in Merkel cell and Hodgkin's disease and others. So whereas we've done well for melanoma patients and have uh, achieved some goals, uh, having therapies with long-term benefit, being able to translate that into care for patients uh, outside of major academic centers, uh, having a backbone to build future therapies on. What we've also done is change the titles that Dr. Carvajal and I have from melanoma to uh, broader immuno-oncology and uh, translational therapy um, and experimental therapeutics. So with all that, I would just like to say on my disclosures, if I gave this talk three years ago, I'd just have one or two people there, and every day, every week, it gets bigger. So I wanted to just recognize our pharmaceutical partners who've really been there with the funding and the support and the basic science work to help us do this. Uh, this uh, shows what I was talking about before. For every tumor type here, we've known that immune cells have been reported infiltrating into the tissues, that tumor-associated Im immunosuppression is there. We know the culprit. It's the tumor. It's not allowing our immune system to work. And these interactions portend a poorer prognosis. Clearly, I could get up here and show you a hundred journals that show the similar things. But the good part of this is that if you walked into uh, NYU, Columbia, the Angeles Clinic, Cedar sinai or any place that's involved in immunotherapy and targeted therapeutics, you would find that there is a clinical trial or a therapy for all of these solid tumors, and I can say that for mine and your institute. We've known that this has substantial susceptibility and the approvals, we've talked about registrations ongoing. Those of you who follow Twitter can look at every minute, there's more and more about the FDA working towards bringing these therapies for us. So as PD-1 has become the pipeline and the backbone for every therapy, I used to start with this and say, look, this is what we have. And I would be, always be amazed that a, when uh, Rich and I began, we were begging for trials, and this is what uh, we had so much that if I started today, by next year when I came to give a talk, I'm invited, right, next year? Yeah, when I came to give the talk, I wouldn't be done with even a quarter of them. But this is where we are now. This is an update, so it's promising. And what I'll talk to you about is what we're trying to figure out with all of these combinations. And interestingly, these phase three trials and where they're going. We have multiple therapies that impact the immune system, and unfortunately we haven't had time to talk about it, but please understand that we're not going away from chemotherapy, radiation, and targeted therapy. We're welcoming them into the joint therapies going in order to help us in every place in the immune system. Infiltration of uh, T cells into tumors, trafficking of those T cells, uh, recognition of the cancer cells, breaking them up, and leading again to priming the uh, activity. In melanoma, all of these are available in the community, and all of these are now the backbones of future therapies. Let me just say that all patients with metastatic solid tumor surgery, radiotherapy, and chemotherapy, and even targeted pathway inhibitions are generally not curative. And this work with immunotherapy is grabbing these therapies and making them uh, better. What we have learned is immunotherapy can help take a patient with a fast-growing tumor and, and uh, lend it to a response. But what we've learned is it takes time. And that's one of the things that's the most important part. And not only for... Uh, for our patients with melanoma. But these patients that do take time for response have a uh, 
survival that is similar to those who initially respond. And that's the most important part. But not just melanoma. This is a patient uh, with melanoma who has that, but you can see the same for gastric cancer, for the patients with lung cancer who are being treated with these drugs. The side effects are milder than what we have seen before, but they do exist. But please be aware that through the work and the that your doctors have done, our physicians are uh, and your and the community is aware. And this is not just for radiation onks, but onco ophthalmologists, nephrologists, uh, pulmonologists are helping with all of this going forward. Although you can see a whole host of toxicities, those patients who have these drugs and are have toxicity and come off therapy still respond. So this is a uh, swimmer's plot. All of these are patients who are on treatment. In blue means they're receiving treatment. In red means they come off of therapy. But the time that they have response continues in all of these patients with the red arrows, and the arrows mean ongoing response. So what we are seeing now for not just melanoma, but for all solid tumors, is the ability to treat, even if you have a toxicity to continue to have benefit and to stop. And these toxicities, this huge table that is too much says that these toxicities, in the majority of time, they resolve. Just like immunization and boosting, we've shown that you can take these therapies and treat someone if they have to stop or if you treat for a short amount of time. At progression, you can get effective reinduction and long-term survival. And the, the one and two year survivals here have gone from 25% to 40% with a year boy to 60 to 80% with PD-1 and greater tails of the curves expected with combination. And not just for melanoma. These are data looking at nivolumab and ipilimumab, which has come into a standard for metastatic melanoma and is now showing the same. Uh, these are spaghetti plots. If you go below, that means tumor is shrinking. This is a function of time. And you can see that you're seeing in renal cell carcinoma the same a significant proportion of the patients responding, responding quickly, having deep responses where a significant proportion of the tumor responds and durable for an extended period of time. And these can also be seen in other solid tumors, including lung cancer. But our goals have not been to just grab every patient with metastatic disease. Our goals have been to help prevent metastatic disease. And through the work of targeted therapy and immunotherapy, this has become a reality. This is data from the adjuvant trial of Yervoy versus placebo, showing initial data of a relapse-free survival benefit and a significant difference in relapse. Now, this data in less than a month will be updated, and the hope for overall survival benefit and the hope to understand the long-term benefits are going to be pro uh, provided. Hopefully, we will see that data and we'll be able to present it to you again in future meetings. But the ability to present this as a standard has moved it to the idea of PD-1 in the adjuvant. What you saw today that was presented was a higher response rate, less toxicity, and possibly better durability with PD-1 therapies. And clearly now at Angeles and other institutes, we are looking at adjuvant trials with PD-1. But let's step away from melanoma and talk about other solid tumors. The world of oncology doesn't like it when we say melanoma is the tumor because it isn't the incidence of colorectal cancer, breast cancer, and lung cancer far dwarfs what we see in melanoma. 
But if you can show a proof of principle in melanoma, it's only a matter of time until this comes to the adjuvant arena for those solid tumors. Again, as we have taken those early patients who have been diagnosed with metastatic cancer and said that we have brought therapies that can be given closer to home, then what we need to look at is setting not only the adjuvant arena, but those places where most oncologists need expert help and advice, and that's brain metastasis. This is a patient that has not been treated by neurosurgery. This is a tumor. This is your brain. Uh, this is a patient who unfortunately or fortunately has not been treated with radiation therapy. This patient has been treated with just your voy and still has a complete response and durable benefit. The same has been seen and presented by colleagues with, uh, this is the brain looking at it head on, no pun intended, uh, with a melanoma there and melanoma there with a uh, res resolution on pembrolizumab. This again is a patient at our institute tr being treated with the combination in all these little areas are uh, brain metastases. And this is an end game, or I should say was an end game in our field, where you would say somewhere between two to four months. I'm happy to say that this woman is three years out and still enjoying her life. She doesn't come to see me anymore, except every six months. And as we've moved from handing PD-1 and BRAF and MEC away to other solid tumors. Us melanoma oncologists and researchers have moved to understand the other uh, accelerators and breaks on the immune system, where trials at our institutions are looking at not only single agent, but combination of these agents. This is data in mice, and I know you're not interested in data in mice, but data in mice says that these combinations are good. And data in mice told us that the combination of anti-CTLA-4 and anti-PD-1 is good. So I'll take the mice. And I'll take it forward and look at options not just to add to PD-1, but to look for those patients who are not benefiting from that single agent or those PD-1 agents. Sometimes when I give these talks, I can feel the stare of that patient who is pushing us to move away from our talks having these slides and into having more slides like this. What's next? So let's talk about what's next. These are trials of OX40 agonists presented by uh, Jeff Infante, a real good guy to have a drink with or to talk melanoma or talk immunology with, and he's at Sarah Cannon. But what they've shown is not only can PDL1 inductions can these the, you induce this immune response in patients treated with single agent PD1. So this is after one cycle, you're making it more immune active. <clears throat> but you can also take you can you can do it many weeks after, and you can do it. Uh, you can start by priming, and and adding PD1, but clearly. Mouse data and histology is not what you want to see. You want to see these scans showing shrinkage of tumor. And this is what my uh, clinic has turned into and what the work at Columbia and Cornell and others have turned into. That we are not interested in you know, redefining PD-1. We're interested in finding other therapies where we can come and show better survival curves and other options. Well, we always got into a fight, Dr. Carvajal and I, because I kept saying immunology, 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 but never talked about targeted therapy. And this is data showing targeted therapy with the BRAF inhibitor having an immune therapeutic ability. So it is an immune therapy. But I should stop and black this out and say, this is not just for melanoma. At this time, BRAF targeted therapy, BRAF MEC targeted therapy is at FDA for approval for lung cancer. 
It is the backbone for therapy for colorectal cancer. Yet 8% of all solid tumors bear this mutation. It exists in 4% of brain tumors. It exists in 50% of papillary thyroid cancers, prostate cancer, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So this data, you can just take it, and I tell my colleague who does GI, just take it and cross out at every place that says melanoma and just put in colorectal cancer or lung cancer. This is the power of the work that we're doing. This is a combination of vetmurafenib, which is a BRAF inhibitor, and a tezolizumab, a PDL1 inhibitor. And what you can see here is significant responses where a majority of patients, or almost all of these patients, had some tumor shrinkage. And what we have shown is that most patients are benefiting, uh, but we're also finding ways to give them together for less toxicity in a staggered approach with higher response rates. And what we will show at the same meeting where we'll show the updated uh, adjuvant data, uh, at the same meeting where we'll look at dosing, uh, is three milligrams best or 10 milligrams best? That final data is gonna be there. At that same meeting, we're gonna show updated data of not just the BRAF inhibitor, but the MEK inhibitor and the BRAF inhibitor and PD-1. And that's great, that's progress. Because we are looking not just to help the lung cancer and not just to help the uh, bladder cancers and the head and neck cancers, but those cancers that have been left out in the cold, those cold tumors where you haven't seen a lot of immune infiltrate, where people say, eh, it'll never work. Well, eh, it works. This is the data with atezolizumab and cobimetinib. Cobimetinib is the MEK inhibitor in colorectal cancer. We've seen that MEK inhibitors, again, are also some form of immunotherapy. What about that? And together in these mice, here are the mice again, uh, we've seen synergy. But this was just in KRAS mutated colorectal cancers, and we're seeing at a point where these tumors had zero response, 20% response, and 40% clinical benefit. So as we look for next year's agenda, we may be talking to patients with multiple solid tumors coming in here. So you melanoma patients will make room for the colorectal, lung cancer patients. And not just that, let's just get away from the checkpoint inhibitors and the antibodies. Let's talk about these things called bispecifics. And bispecifics uh, target two things. That's why they're bi. They bring two things together. And in the easiest form, this is like a matchmaker Yenta type antibody. It brings the cancer cell to the T cell. It hooks up here. It hooks it up to the T cell. Creates an immune synapse where the T cell can excrete all of its uh, toxins and kill the tumor. This has been shown in melanoma to have response, but not just that. Sometimes in these melanoma symposiums, the ocular melanoma patients come and they say, well, we've been left out in the cold. Not really. And we're seeing responses here, complete responses in ocular melanoma, and we're working to improve that and putting that, this drug together with not just PDL one but ctl 4 and not just doublets, but triplets and quadruplets are coming. And that's going to be there for our patients. Harnessing the immune system will also mean being able to take T cells out, grow them out to uh, 60 to 120 billion, give them back to the patient with an immune stimulator and see response. And not just at, at, at few centers. This is a protocol that we've opened <coughs> at Angeles and Cedars and is open at multiple sites through the nation where you give the T cells in your hospital, you give the T cells to your patients. These are the patients on T cells. The surgery is done in your clinic. It's sent away in a central place, grows it all up. The central place has the lab that makes the billions of cells that you need. So we're bringing this not just for melanoma, this is being looked at in ovarian cancer. How the lion who's running this protocol is also has a protocol for cervical cancer. And I'm sure you'll agree that 
cervical cancer may be a, a greater epidemic throughout the world. So let's not just talk about the United States anymore. Uh, you can also take these T cells and make them more specific to your body. And you, you can grow those T cells and see that they don't work, but you can also take them and make them stronger T cells that attack in a better fashion, more rabid, more ravenous. Um, I always like talking about TVEC. TVEC is a great drug. I just like to begin by saying it's an injectable, and that's always when I say injectable, the dermatologists perk up, but this is not Botox, this is not Restylane. This is something that's been genetically modif modified to inject into the tumor, only infects the tumor. Not just melanoma anymore, trials are being done with this for head and neck cancer. Trials are being done for breast cancer with this agent, and I call this the Mick Jagger effect. You inject that virus in, not just because it's a herpes virus, but you inject it in. It's just like a rock star in a hotel room. It gets in there, it breaks that hotel room apart, it multiplies in there, and then it sends it to other areas, other tumors, and can affect other tumors. What I would also say is TVEC codes for an immune agent that stimulates the T cells also. And what we have seen is not just local effects. This is a patient who was injected in a couple of these areas and everything went away. But what we've seen is also distant effects. This is being combined with pembrolizumab and also with ipilimumab. You can see the initial data presented showed a response rate almost at 60%. This is great because the toxicity of this is almost zero. It's flu-like symptoms, injection site reactions, fevers and chills, and in combination, what you're seeing here is early response rates that mimic what ipilimumab, nivolumab response rates were. You're seeing a combination that can be less toxic. We're also looking around in the tumor microenvironment. Oh, by the way, same meeting we're going to, you're coming. Uh, ASMO is going to present initial data looking at randomized, whether this really does do better than just single agents alone. <laughs> the microenvironment is uh, another thing that we're looking at. Epicatastat targets IDO, which is an immune inhibitor. Th that's not a checkpoint. But what we're seeing again here, here's that number, 53% response rates and increasing response rates in kidney cancer, lung cancer, that's trans, that's bladder cancer. I forget what EA is. This is triple negative breast cancer and this is uh, squamous of the head and neck. So multiple different tumor types. We're also looking at progression uh, and how to uh, see who responses and how they're going to uh, progress. We want your blood. We also want your tissue. Um, because predictive biomarkers are the future. When I get up here and I present five options that have 50 to 60 percent response rates, I'm not sure at all that those are the same patients. So if we could figure out who benefits on this better than that and that, or who only needs single agent, the combination therapies that become selective can give you an aggregate response rate of higher than 50, 60%. They can give you an aggregate of 80% or 90% because you're looking at multiple options. Used to be that we'll look at mutations in the tumor, T cell CD8 density and pdl one expression, but fortunately and unfortunately, this is the lock we have to fix now. You're looking at genomics, microbiome, that's a stool, and how it affects the bacteria in your stool, affects your toxicities and your response, your immune function, your epigenetics, which is another talk into itself, so a lot more. So treatment selection will look at these tumors that are hot already and those tumors that are not how we can make them hotter. Uh, here is uh, IDO inhibitors, here's TVEC, or even how we can bring those T cells in. And here's a, uh, adoptive T cell therapy and vaccines and radiation. 
There's a lot to do. We're also looking at the, just the T cells themselves, and it can tell you who needs just single agent in the green and who needs combination. All of this is going into our considerations, not just looking at the tissue, not just looking at the blood uh, gene signatures or the mutational load, all of that. Biopsying at multiple <coughs> different sites. And this is usually where I end. I stole this from a lovely gentleman who is a melanoma oncologist who's gone to, uh, just like uh, TVEC, has gone to other areas to spread and uh, infect other people's thoughts. And what we will have and what we're working to is a way to just have your initial tumor and not just look at the genetics of it, but look at the tumor microenvironment. Is it inflamed, not inflamed? Is it strong PD-1 or not? Is it weak PD-1? Can we give something together? What's the right thing? Is it an immune suppressive microenvironment that needs IDO inhibitor or a, another type of therapy? Or is there no identifiable immune targets where we need to bring in chemotherapy, radiation, and targeted therapy. So this is the future, and this is what you're getting at your institute today. So melanoma effect in every solid tumor is monotherapy, adjuvant therapy, combinations to cure, hopefully, biomarker development, uh, optimization of the next generation of therapies. This has all come from your ability to support the physicians in this room to do their work and your ability to be part of clinical trials and to spread the word and bring other patients like yourselves into the fold because this melanoma effect is not just physician, radiation oncologist wise or social worker wise, it's patient. It, it, it's organic through patient uh, involvement. And with that, I'd like to thank you for listening, and uh, thank you for the invitation. <laughs>